we've been doing uh, from San Francisco to Houston and I forget where else we've been. Uh, it is good to be able to preach on a Sunday morning here uh, in beautiful Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Amen. Uh, it is a joy to be able to do so, especially on Easter Sunday. Let's uh, grab our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Come on, bro. I hope that uh, your week is going well. And uh, for whatever reason it's not, I pray that after listening to the word of God, it will go better. In Philippians chapter 3, uh, let's uh, pick up here in verse 7. So here is uh, the Apostle Paul, who has been a disciple for some time now. And his circumstances... If you, if I would tell you, which I will, the letter he's about to, that he writes and he gives to the church of Philippi, honestly, from a humanistic standpoint, makes no sense. Because the circumstances are ones that are not ideal, are ones that you and I would not choose to be in his circumstance. He is in prison. And here in Philippi, he sends his letter, and they read it, and they get the heart of Paul, which is really the heart of Jesus here in verse 7. It says here, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. It says, whatever I used to consider profit. What, is that, what does that mean? Anything. A relationship. A job. A career. Security. All those different things from Paul's perspective, where he's at in his walk with God at this moment, he said, look, you can take all that stuff and you can take it. Wow, come on, bro. I don't want anything else. For the sake of Christ. And he is writing this letter from a prison cell. Wow. Wow. Let's continue reading in verse 8. Right. What if more? I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Do you think Paul's full of having a blind side? No. No. There's nothing he wanted more. I think Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, Risen Sunday, whatever title you want to give it, it's about asking yourself one simple question. What do I want more? What do I want? What do I want in my life? We got one shot at this. One shot. You know, there's nothing written in stone that says that we will celebrate other Easter together. Right. What do I really, really want? Yeah. Paul's not saying what he wants. I want to know Christ. Yeah. I want to know Christ. Yeah, come on. It's a powerful, powerful passage. Yeah. It says, it continues, it says, I consider them rubbish. That I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Look at verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, Becoming like Him in his death. You know, this morning, I've entitled the lesson, The Power of the Resurrection. I don't believe that someone can understand a little bit more about the power of the resurrection, even if it's not in its fullest. I don't believe that you cannot hear and understand the power of the resurrection and not in some way, shape, or form be changed. Yeah. I just don't believe that. Yeah. Come on, bro. The only way that would happen is if you make a conscious choice to harden your heart this very moment. Yeah. You're like, 
Alright, what time is Olive Garden opening at? This is the thing about Texas that I, like, I'm still like learning more and more. Most places are close to them. Which you can appreciate, you know, for a lot of people who are working. Um, but, um, I don't know what we do for lunch. <laughs> so, I am begging you, and I'm imploring you. Just listen. Yeah. This morning. Come on. Because there is power in the resurrection. Yeah. Right. Let's go to Luke 24. Come on, Come on. I had uh, an incredible, like, spread. Like, I feel like it was Thanksgiving as I was preparing for the sermon. Thanksgiving is probably one of my favorite holidays. Oh, yeah. 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 There's something about
You would pick your disciples and you would not pick women. Sadly, they were looked upon as second class. Not the Jesus. Jesus rose and elevated that role the way that God intended it to be. The Bible said that being early in Sunday morning, I believe, as you see in the scriptures here, motivated by an affection for Jesus, yet without faith. They see Jesus just two days before. Their Lord. Yeah. The guy who fed 5,000. Yeah. And he's on the cross and they see his head and his eyes fall. They witness him breathing his last. Yeah. As a result of seeing this, their faith gets ex ex extinguished. It gets, it gets taken out of them. But yet they have enough affection for Jesus that they wake up early in the morning to go to the tomb trying to look for him. But their faith is shattered. They get there and they see the tomb empty and they don't know what's going on. It doesn't tell us that they were talking to one another. Say, hey, uh, so I wonder, where, I wonder where Jesus went because I know he resurrected. They're not talking to each other like this. They're perplexed. They're deflated. Because they witnessed darkness surround them just two days before. They're powerless. They felt that death was stronger than the promise of God. I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you have a certain affection still to Jesus that brought you here this morning in church. But you find yourself with very little or with no faith at all. Yeah. I pray that after the lesson, yeah. that you will be filled with faith. Yeah. Because although these women got to the tomb with no faith, man, did they change also their known worlds yeah. as a result of responding to the resurrection. Yeah. They go in, it's empty. They have no anticipation of the resurrection. They have no clue what's going on. And I don't feel like God sees the, the state of their heart. And he summons two angels. Mm. Hey guys, I, I, I think they just, they, they don't get it. Yeah. Sorry. I spent three years with them. Yeah, yeah, right. I kept talking about the fact that I was going to leave. I was going to go prepare a room for them. I, I mean, I said it in so many different ways. But just go down there. Go down there and help them because we're also be staring at an empty tomb for 2,000 years. It's almost like these women, although they walked with Jesus, heard him preach, or saw the miracles, it's almost as if they forgot everything they had ever learned. They got so weak in their faith. If you like put them at that state, of where they're at, and you put them when they were walking with Jesus, the disciples would have never recognized them. Yeah, like, oh, you're, you're, you're new to the church, huh? <laughs> like, no, oh, but you're, like, but their faith was just so weak. Here's the thing with character and faith. It's not constant. Your character can get better. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Your character, who you are, you can't get better. Your faith can get stronger, but you can also get worse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these women are left with a question. Where's the body? Right. What's up with the empty tomb? How do I piece this together? There is no answers. There is truly a sense of hopelessness in these women. How do I go about this now? How did this even happen? And that's what God agrees. Yeah. God tells him. God speaks. And he summons the angels. God sees the dullness of their hearts. God loves them. Yes. He sees their faithlessness. But the grace of God sends two angels to them. 
I remember as I was listening to our dear brother Victor share here for restoration. I was uh, able to be in his Bible study last night. And every person who gets restored, it's very special, of course, to God. And it's special to me because I had to get restored. So automatically, it sends me back in time. Yeah. Of when I got restored eight years ago. Yeah, come on, Fernando. Yeah. I had drifted from God. Yeah, come on, Fernando. I, I had the same Bible studies that every single member of the church goes to. Come on, bro. I, I went to the events. I went to the winter workshops. I went to the conferences. I, I did all those things. And at some point, now, I can't exactly pinpoint exactly when, but somehow, like when you're in the ocean and you're, you're, you're having a good time and not even realizing, you're like, oh, I'm over there. Yeah. Come on, Fernando. Come on, Fernando. And I drifted. So true. And all that work in those early years as a disciple, building my character, building my faith, yeah. working on bad habits, removing those things, all those things that I had began to lose them. My character and my faith became to deteriorate. Yeah. If I was once prideful, like very prideful, we all got a certain amount of pride. Amen. Amen. Like, no. Okay, right. All right. <laughs> There's always going to be that we got to like, keep it under control. I'm talking about like a significant amount of arrogance. But over the years of like having quiet time, discipling, all these great things we have in God's kingdom, my character had been had transformed. But when I began to drift, guess what started happening? That stuff started coming back. And I began to see years of bending and molding myself, sadly, kind of gone to waste. After a while, honestly, the, 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 the one descriptor, when I read this passage, I said, man, I, I can relate to that. I felt so powerless, yeah. so hopeless. Like, honestly, even though I tasted the milk and honey at one point, I said, I don't know how I can ever get there again. There's no way. I remember when we first read the new movement, I was like, there's no way. I can't. I said, These people are like uh, giants. You, I looked at you, I looked at the videos, I, I said, I can't do what they do. I'll play go and follow it. That's how we go in my faith. I believe God in his infinite grace saw the dullness of my heart. Saw that I would be staring at an empty tomb. For years and years and years as my life would deteriorate. And say, you, you, you deficit enough. You've heard your marriage enough. You've heard your kids enough. Let me send angels to you. And I remember applying for jobs, wasn't getting them. We got so close. We're like, man, it's a perfect job. So down the street, I would not get it. Yeah. And then I get this job. They had me fly into San Francisco. And back in the day, you used to check into Facebook. You know what I mean? I mean, it's uh, very yeah. weird. Some of you are thinking Facebook people. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> I realized about you, you're on Instagram, that's Facebook. Okay. For us, we're on Facebook, they used to have this checking up. And I checked in, and it said, hey, Fernando is in San Francisco. Coincidence that the brother who studied the Bible with me happened to be on Facebook at the very moment, and he saw me check in. No. An angel. Go talk to this guy. Oh, wow. I remember having dinner with him. Everything changed. Wow. I began to see again. Wow. Come on. And I had found myself in a position where I needed to regain my faith. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, babe. My first point of this that I'm describing is that resurrection has the power to rise. Come on, bro. Come on. You and I are like Phoenixes. Yes. Who, if we're not careful, we will fall and be buried in a ton of ashes. Come on. But the Phoenix can rise. And that's Jesus Christ. And the power of the resurrection. It doesn't matter how far you trusted. If 
by the grace of God for our dear brother Victor was just a couple of months. Yeah. Aaron recounted the cost last night. He goes, no, I know for a fact now. Wow. I cannot do this alone. Let's go. I, I want to be the kingdom. That's all I want. I want to do anything. You know, and go anywhere. I have a son. to rise is what you and I have as disciples because of the resurrection. Yeah, come on. The angels tell him, God speaks to them. And he sees them hopeless, powerless, and what do they say? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Wow. There is. He's not here. He has risen. Mm -hmm. That statement, he has risen, yeah. is such a powerful statement. The word risen has so much significance. Yeah. Risen means death is defeated. Yeah. The whole story of the Bible, you have death yes. in the shadows yeah. of mankind. Since the fall of Adam in the garden, what does God tell him? He says, you are dust, and to dust you will return. In the book of Romans chapter 5, Paul says and describes this, Death has reigned. It became present with Adam all the way to Jesus. No one could escape it. All will be subject to its cruelty until now. Peter describes it perfectly in Acts chapter 2 when the kingdom began. It says, death cannot keep its hold on him. Death has been defeated. For the time of Adam, Death had a way in, but no way out. People went into death, but could not get out of it. No way to enter the true presence of God. Come on, Fernando. From the days of the Old Testament, they are left waiting until the day of Jesus to die on the cross and to be resurrected. Jesus changed the very nature of death and created a way out. See, now if you die as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, you will like Christ go through death in a passageway to directly to the very throne of the Almighty God. If you're familiar with Jacob's dream in the book of Genesis. He dreams of a ladder and angels going up and down this, this ladder to the presence of God. Jesus in John chapter 151, you can jot it down. Look how he describes himself. I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What was Jacob's dream when he was running away from his brother who wanted to kill him? He lays down on a rock of all things. The rock being Jesus Christ. Has this dream, not knowing its significance, and then foreshadows 2,000 years later. And it's Jesus. Jesus changed death forever. He opened a passageway to God. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus went through death to provide you and I the very same opportunity. He has risen. Yeah. Is what that statement means. He has broken the power of death. Risen means that death is finally defeated. Yeah. Therefore, no matter how hopeless you might feel, yeah. how powerless you might feel, how faithless you might feel, like, I don't know if I can ever get there. Wow. You have the power to rise. Yes. Come on, come on, come on. Though it might feel dark. Yes. Though maybe just two days ago, something happened to you, to your family, someone you love, come on, bro. and you were broken. You, through the resurrection, have access, have a passageway. Heaven is open, but you must go through yeah. Christ. Let's go to John chapter 1. Point number 2. The power 
to fully redeem. See, the resurrection has power. It has the power to enable us to rise from any ashes. It also has the power to fully redeem us. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. But the darkness has not understood us. The scripture tells us that Jesus has risen. Which also means that the whole person can be redeemed. See, the message of Easter is not just that Jesus is alive. It is way more than that. It is more profound than that. It is that Christ has risen. Remember the Son of God, according to the book of John, was alive before he took human form. He was with God from the very beginning. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, it says they were making the cosmos. They were breathing things into existence. And it was two. It was Jesus and God the head. Jesus already was alive before he even became the form of man. That was always, always true. You think about this. Why did not Jesus just simply leave his crucified body in that tomb and return to the Father in his spirit? Since after all, he was already alive. He's always had life. Why did he not just leave and just go in his spirit? The angel could have still told the women, hey, he is alive. He still listens to your prayers. He will still help you just like he always did. He's with his father. The angel could have said that. It's very similar to this. Think about it this way. Come on, Fernando. Whenever you've been to a celebration of life, service, yeah. or you've been to a funeral, typically you hear words like, your body might be here but their souls with God. The message of Easter is not simply that he's alive. It's that he has risen. Yeah. He is here to fully redeem us. Come on, Fernando. When God had a purpose to redeem you and I, it was not just your spirit. It was not just your soul. It was the whole self that God created. Your mind, your soul, your body, your spirit. He wants to redeem everything in you. The message of the resurrection is that he can redeem every single part. Even though the parts that you feel like cannot be redeemed. There's some of us here this morning that think, well, I don't think you really understand what I've done. And we live in a constant state of guilt, in a constant state where we can move forward, we cannot. And for some reason, we look at the neighbor next to us or somebody else, we know that God can redeem them. But he cannot redeem me. The power of the resurrection is that he can fully redeem. There is no limit. The way God created us it's pretty amazing. Yeah. He created the angels, souls, without bodies. He created animals, bodies, without souls. He created humans, men and women, uniquely with body and soul together. This is why death is so powerful. Because it aims to separate what God brought together. It's the undoing of the very nature that God gave you and I. The survival of the soul by itself is not really victory over death. If Jesus would have left his body there and just got his spirit, it would not convey victory over death. The whole person. Yes, come on. The 
defeating death. Right. God can redeem anyone, anywhere, at any place. Look back to Luke 24. Look at how Jesus emphasizes the physical aspect of his resurrection here in Luke 24, verse 36. It says, well, they were still talking about this. This is after the resurrection. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have something, anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of rolled fish. He took it, ate it in their presence. He's all right, you guys are clearly not getting me down the line here. What do you need? The, these guys follow Jesus. They're a wizard. And when he shows up, they think he is a ghost. So look at my hands. Come over here. Come here. Touch. Look at my feet. Fine. Give me some of these. This is not Christ. Minus the body. This is not a doctrine of ongoing spiritual existence when it comes to Jesus. This is simply, this is simply a shadow. It's not simply a shadow of what was to come. This is flesh and soul and spirit whole. It is the flesh that was raised to life. This is not Christ without body. It's not Christ with another body. It is a very body. Right. Remember that Jesus tells them, it is I. It is I myself. You're not seeing a part of me, a piece of me. You're seeing the whole of me. It's not just like a spiritual capacity. It's the fullness of me. I have triumphed over death. Yes. Wow. Wow. Since the nature of the resurrection, this is the resurrection that you and I get to look forward to. Yeah. Come on, as Jesus resurrected, we also, as sold out disciples, one day will resurrect. Yeah. The whole of you, your body and soul, that's the whole point of the resurrection. The power to fully redeem. Yes. Imagine you're taking a vacation. Let's pick a spot. Let's say you go to Hawaii. Nice. 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 loves you very much. <laughs> he buys a ticket for you. <laughs> now, he happened, now, he happened to not talk to his wife before he bought the ticket. <laughs> so they got in a bit of a bump over it. But the tickets are in your hand. Fired up. Yeah, you, are. you know, you go and the Dallas Metro play like, try to find like a Hawaiian store or like a tropical store to find like the, the gear to like, get a shirt. Yeah. Yeah. And you're geared up. You got the shirt, you got the, the flip flops, yeah. you get new sunglasses, you're ready to go. <laughs> then as you're kind of like getting your, your luggage up the stairs of your apartment complex, somehow you slip. Oh. <laughs> like one of the flip flops got stuck in one of the wheels. You decided to go with the cheaper kind, that one that was like the like, you mean like grab on the floor. You went cheap on the flip flops. <laughs> and you're literally tumbling down the stairs. 
and you break up the bones. No. And your body really is in no way, shape, or form able to go on this trip. Bummed out, nades and deads, life's not happening. <laughs> but you have a good friend who's really good with computers. And they say, how about this? He's really fired up. Calls up and what? I can take you there to Hawaii. I can take you there. Wow. You're so grateful. He's like, really? I mean, I can't even move. I'm like, you know. I can give you a virtual tour. And he puts these goggles on you, like the VR headset. And you can even smell the fire. You're literally surfing uh, in Hawaii. <laughs> You're there, take off the goggles. He's like waiting for like your words of affirmation from you, you know? And they, you know, thank you, but the truth is, like, I would have really wanted to go. He's like, what do you mean? You did go! You smelled the flowers, you were there, you were surfing, what are you talking about? <laughs> See, unless your body's there, yeah. you haven't really gone. Yeah. The resurrection tells you that heaven is real. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just some sort of spiritual experience. Yeah. It's not some sort of like virtual experience that you can experience in your mind. Like Jesus resurrecting his body, his whole self. Wow. Is God saying to you, but this is real. Yeah, yeah that's true. Come what on. I'm telling you is real. Yeah. It's not like, like offside compensation package just to appease you. <laughs> you and I are going to experience something that no one will ever be able to understand. Yeah. Well, you just don't know me, Fernando. Like, there's certain things in my life that I can't even say in public. If you understand my character and how I've damaged my character over the years. You know, I get into discipling time, mentoring time with couples. And sometimes the wife might say, well, it just been this way for such a long time. And I don't see if anything is going to really change. That's just a real truth. Now the wife still has some level of affection towards the husband. Amen. But what is absent? Faith. The affection's there. But let me tell you something as this pertains to your relationship with God. Just having affection won't last to the very end. The power of the resurrection is the ability of God to fully redeem you and I. The body, the soul, the spirit, the mind, everything. Therefore, you and I are those who fight. We fight against faithlessness. We fight against doubts. Some of us heard the transitions, you were like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He's like, I don't know. How do you feel, brother? It's like, look, for us, as better sweets, we love Dallas. If it would have been up to me, I like live in Dallas, die in Dallas, and like marry my kids in Dallas. But that's not my will. Come on. You and I have to navigate the transition and change in our life and everything in life. Yeah. And we cannot allow thought of faithlessness of what's going to happen to this incredible church. Yeah. You know what God's going to do? Yeah. God can fully redeem. Yeah. God can fully do all the things that you and I can even imagine. Yeah. Our greatest encouragement from Los Angeles will be, look at the Dallas Fort Worth International. The resurrection has 
the power to fully redeem us in every sense of the word. Let's go to John chapter 20. My last point, the power for everlasting change. John chapter 20, the power for everlasting change. Come on, babe. Come on, bro. We're with you. John 20, verse 19. Let me encourage you by taking a snapshot of where the disciples were at after the crucifixion. Amen? Amen. If you find yourself like Anna doing to us spiritually, let me encourage you here. Verse 19. This is just for me, specifically for him. <laughs> Pick it up, I'm pick it, up. <laughs> it says verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and said, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Let's go over here to verse 26. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, my God! Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. The disciples, as we saw in the other accounts, are disillusioned, discouraged, afraid. They are not anticipating the resurrection. They think it's the end of the story. We're done. This is our life. We're locked in a house. We're quarantined. It's pandemic time. I don't think Texas really experienced a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> merciful to you. When the pandemic hit, we were in the mayor in San Francisco. We were locked and loaded. We were, you cannot leave your house. Like, going down to like, the stock went, like, up. Because everyone was like, hey, order in, order in, order in, you know what I mean? We were locked. The disciples are in a position where they're so afraid. In their minds, here is what's reigning. Death. Death has power. More than the promise of God. Wow. Since they all fell away, it wasn't just Peter. They all left God. They are now feeling ashamed, guilt. They cannot be redeemed. How can I possibly be redeemed after leaving the Son of God? Yeah. There's no everlasting change. It's how they feel. Definitely not change for the better. They're like, all right, we're locked. We're going to run out of food. Uh, the Jews, they do see me, they might put in prison. Like, it's only going to get worse here, Peter. Like, I, I'm sorry. Like, I heard you being bad, bad, the uh, pair of bad news, John. Uh, I know Jesus loved you, and you said that in your <laughs> book, but... Uh, uh, like, and they're feeling it. Then what happens? Jesus appears. Yeah. Now, it says that the doors were locked, though. How is it that Jesus body can go through a locked door. How is this possible? He has risen. Not just he's been resuscitated. God raises Jesus' body. The body was raised. At the same time the body is raised, the nature and the capacity of the body of Jesus was changed forever. The body of Jesus Christ was also adapted to be appropriate for the everlasting time with God. This was entirely new in the Bible. We knew of accounts of other people in the scriptures who were brought back to life. We think of Lazarus, for example. Dies, Jesus 
raises him back to life. Yeah. Yeah. But it is his same body. Lazarus had to go through the cruelty of death again. His body had not yet transformed. It had not changed the way that Jesus' body changed. Yeah. Uh -huh. Jesus' body was now not tied to aging. Can we say amen for that? Amen. Not subject to sickness. Yeah. Not subject to pain. Yeah. A body that could face no disability was the body he had. Not even limited by the physics of this world. Yeah. And it is his flesh. And he says, it is I, it is I myself. See, it was flesh transformed and adapted to enjoy a life in eternity. Wow. This same promise is for you and I. Come on. One day, Jesus will redeem your body. Yeah. Amen. He is trying to perfect your soul. Wow. And he will adapt your body so you can enjoy eternity wow. in his presence. Wow. This is an incredible gift. If salvation is not a gift already, yeah. this gift of our bodies transforming and changing in this manner so we can enjoy the presence of God for all eternity is incredible. I think about it like during the holidays, when it's Christmas time, we have a rule in my house. We open gifts Christmas morning. I think I want gifts. Yeah, I mean. I think Christmas morning, everybody's going to be ready. Everyone, a whole family's got to be there to open the gifts. And usually the older kids are ready to go, you know, like, right, the chop chop, they're ready to go and rock and roll. Like, hey, no, Vivi's still asleep, we got to wake her up. <laughs> we gotta get her ready. Until the whole family's there. Then we get the gift. It will be the same way for us. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. Look at verse 42. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Yeah. For those disciples that we know, like our dear sister in San Francisco, who died at the very young age, I believe it's 21, who went up to glory. She gets to enjoy the presence of Christ in paradise, but she also is waiting for this gift. When you and I and a trumpet is sound, and Jesus comes back, and those who have faithfully died as disciples will be risen up first, yeah. and your body will be changed. <laughs> you would defy the odds of physics. You will not experience pain or aging or anything else, just like Jesus Christ. And the rest of us who might still be alive, we will be raised up with him and also we will be changed. This is the gift that awaits you and I. The power of everlasting change. My question to you this morning as we close out is will you experience that? Will you be a part of that?
Will you be someone who desires nothing else? As we start off this lesson, what do you want? I want to be there. Yeah. Come on, Fernando. I want to be there. Yeah. Nothing that this world has to offer for me will ever compare with the ability to be in the very presence of God yeah. in this transformed body with my soul for eternity with God. Yeah. Yeah. This morning you and I celebrate that Jesus is not just alive, but he has risen. Yeah. Today we celebrate the power of the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. That you and I have the power to rise. Yeah. We have the power to be fully redeemed. And we have the power to have everlasting change in our lives. Yes. Until that day happens, yes. I want to charge us that we put our hands to the plow, yes. that we focus, and we invest ourselves, and that we offer the power of the resurrection to a lost world that we've never done so before. I love you guys. Have a great evening.